So today is going to be a continuation of a series that I've been doing on non-dual awareness. And last Sunday, I, I told a, a, a classic story to kind of demonstrate this point. Um, it's been in the traditions for thousands of years, the, the idea of um, a couple who, who mistake a rope for a snake and go through the drama of the fear of the snake only to find out that it is just a rope. So today I want to kind of play on that same idea of the, uh, the imagined reality, the snake, the illusion, the uh, hallucination that our minds create about what's actually there and then how we take that to be real and then live a life based on that. But I take it a little bit more um, bigger and then also try and bring it back to um, the daily life you know, as we live it. And all of this is, is in the, the context of the, the non-dual tradition, the, probably the most um, commonly referred to is Advaita Vedanta. So in the, in the, in the main teaching of the Vedanta school, is stop. Just stop. And the most common question that comes up when a student hears that instruction is stop what? What am I to stop? You ask the teacher, stop what? And the teacher will say, just stop. Whatever it is that you're doing, just stop. And that's the answer until you finally get it, until you finally get what it is that you were to stop doing. So this series of talks that I'm doing is each Sunday is I talk about a specific something that we're always doing, that the teaching is an invitation to stop doing that. I'm going to try and make it a little less nebulous and give you some uh, tangible examples, right? some, put some handles on it so you have a sense of what it is that this instruction is inviting you to do. So uh, for today, we're going to start off with um, a little uh, experiment. And that'll be the basis of the whole talk. So, some of you have gone through this with me before. Many of you, this will be new. So we have 10, 4, 6, 8, 10, 10, 15, 15. Okay. So I'm going to pass around some balloons. And you, know, you can take two or three, given the number that we have. So take two or three, pass them around. All you're going to do is just blow it up, tie it off. If you grab a couple, blow up a couple, tie it off. And, uh, and then just hang on to them for a bit until we're all done, and then we'll go on to um, part two. Okay. Now, take a moment and just notice the room. Seem pretty much the same as before? Does it seem to be missing any space? Do you notice any holes anywhere? Right? It's exactly the same as before we filled up the balloons. Now, oddly enough, that room actually has less space because it's got a bunch of balloons in it. So how does that happen? That in this room, we filled up those balloons with space, and then we take them over into that room, and that this room is not short any space. Like, so did the space in here get smaller when we filled up the balloons? Oh. 
Okay. So there was a, you had a sense of change of, of the amount of space in the room. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So if this were a sealed room and we did that with the balloons, we could say that there would be less air in here. Right? We would have taken air out of the room. If you did it underwater and you filled the balloons with water, and then you took the balloons out of the water, there'd be less water. But when you do it with space, there's no change to the space. This is a somewhat unique quality of space. Is you can't have more or less of it. It's constant. Now, this is a metaphor, so don't think about it too hard, because you will find an exception to the rule. But if you keep your thinking light, it's a great metaphor. Space. No matter what you do to it, you can't have more or less of it. And so this is what the tradition, the non-dual school, tells us about reality. It is unchangeable. It is constant. This is a truth about you. The real you is unchangeable. It is constant. Things can happen, like you can fill up a balloon in this room and then you can take it in that room and something happened, but yet space is unaffected by it. So events can happen, phenomena can arise, but space is unchanged by it, unaffected. And it would say the same thing is true of you. Now, that's the truth that the non-dual school tells us, that we're invited to consider, is that this is as true of us as it is of space. But yet, we don't experience ourselves that way. We don't experience our life that way. We take the events that are happening, we take our experience to be real, and we take changes to be actual. Right? Good changes, we're happy about them. Bad changes, we're sad about them. Right? So we react to them. What's that? Change. Um, uh, getting older. Um, breaking a bone in your foot. One moment you're dancing, the next moment you're laying down in agony. Change. Right? What's that? Oh, well, n not necessarily, just your experience changes. You're, ha you're having this experience and then you're having that experience. Yeah. Space is, space is constant. What's happening within it changes. Space itself remains unaffected. Exactly. Same as our true nature. So, this is the invitation of the non-dual perspective, to come to know ourselves as our true nature, to know ourselves as that unchanging constant. And from that place, of our unchangeable, constant, to from there bear witness to all of these things that we consider to be change. Simply things arising in the midst of us, but having no effect on us. That's, that's the invitation. But all of us live at a place where we don't have that perspective. We have the perspective of that which is changeable, that which is changing. And then we have a response, a reaction to that change, call it good or bad. Right? And then we live on the basis of that. We take that to be the truth. We live on the basis of that. Right? So to continue our space metaphor, to try and give 
uh, again, a little bit of a sense of what we're all so used to doing that it's almost impossible to see because we, we, we were born into a world already doing it, into a world of people who don't have an idea that they're doing it, and from them we learned to do it without any sense ever of the not doing of it. So it's really hard to see this part of ourselves because it's, it, it's, a, it's part of who we take ourselves to be. So I want to talk about it again in, in our metaphor of space. So this is uh, a bit of science that's happening right now. Right? So for really for thousands of years, but if we bring it more into the era of modern science, right. for hundreds of years, space has been seen to be a continuous field. Right. Just a continuous field. It is not, space is not made up of particles, it is continuous. Right. A seamless whole. That is how space has been taken to be the view of science. Space is continuous, it's a field. But now, there is a, a new uh, relationship with space, right? which is to quantize space, to break space up into little bits so that we can measure it and understand it. It's, it's uh, too hard for our mind to be able to understand it as a whole, as one continuous whole, so we have to break it into bits and then assign qualities to those bits and then we can say something about it. Right. So sure enough, I mean, this is happening and we are learning a great deal about some aspects of space that were perplexing us. For example, like the space-time phenomena and how, how space can bend, right? So you get space near a, a black hole and space seems to warp, right? And how could that happen, right? And this has been a perplexing question for science. So in order to try and study this, they quantized space. And then they could measure the amount of distortion and they can start to say things about what's happening, name the phenomenon, create relationships of this is over there and that's over there. We're going to say a lot of things about it. And they're, in many ways, seemingly helpful. Right? And it's true. It begins to help us actually navigate the physical world better. But I use this as an example because it's so new. Right? Most, none of us have probably never heard of it. Right? So you haven't had a chance to uh, habituate to it to take it to be the case. Mm -hmm. But it won't take long, a couple of generations of physicists, and they will start to think about space in units because that's what they talk about it. They handle it and they deal with it and they measure it and the knowledge of what we think we know about space is all based on space being quantized. So then we'll start to take space to actually be not a continuous field, uninterrupted, without units, but to be quantized. And in that moment, we will have lost track of the truth. We will be operating under the illusion, right, the hallucination, the imagined space as having units, and be taking that to be the case. And the knowledge, this is part of the seduction of knowledge, because knowledge, again, especially the physical world, helps us navigate the physical world and go about our day doing what we do and to do it better and more effectively and more efficiently. And because it does that, we take it to be true. We take it to be reality when it's not. It's not reality. It's a hallucination that we imagined and it was helpful 
so we've kept it around. And that hallucination produced what we call knowledge, and we took that knowledge to be valid because it was verifiable and predictable, and we took that to be reality. So this is happening right now with this idea of quantizing space. But we haven't succumbed to the illusion yet, but we will. So we can take that as an example and then work backwards. Where in our lives have we already done this? Where are we already doing it? Taking what we imagine to be true, to be true, and then the experience we have that is validated by that which we took to be true, confirms that it must be true. And we convince ourselves that this must be the way it is because it seems to work. It's functional. So this is, this is one of the activities that the non-dual school would invite us to stop doing. So the instruction of stop is to stop taking your imagined reality to be the truth. So that seems you know, simple enough, easy enough to say, OK. You know, I mean, if I, took it, if I knew that I was, it was an imagination, I'd stop doing it. You can all probably feel a sense of like, like, yep, that makes sense to me. The problem is coming to see our act of imagining, to see the trick we're playing on ourselves. So to use the, the example of the snake and the rope, to see where we're taking the imagined snake that is really a rope. To find out where, moment to moment, day to day, as we live our lives, where we're doing this. And then in seeing it, begin the process of saying, you know, do I really need to do that? Do I have to continue taking this to be the truth? That doesn't mean to stop doing the, the, the way it allows you to navigate the world. Right? Like, if you come to see, for example, that time is really just a mental construct, right? time is an illusion, okay, so that's a fairly easy one to get to with a little bit of a conversation. Uh, we can come to see cognitively, like, yeah, time is an illusion. My mind is where time exists. Outside of my mind, time does not exist, right? But if you come to see that, that doesn't mean you don't show up on time for things, right? You don't just go home and throw away your watch and throw away the calendar and, and then just stumble through life, like, hoping that things go well for you. Right? That's, that's not necessary, nor is that what you're, is being asked of you. All that is being asked is, in the example of time, if you come to, to, to recognize that time is an illusion, then stop seeing it as a part of reality and see reality without time. And then, you know, when you need to be someplace at 9 o'clock because there's a Sunday service, you know, use your watch, show up at 9, that's fine. Nothing wrong with it. Right? So this is another place where, where we tend to get confused and frustration arises. As we, as we, as we try and understand these teachings and we try and, and, and respond to the ask, we think that we have to throw out kind of our ordinary knowledge that helps us navigate the world. Right? There's this fear that comes up, that, it, that if it isn't reality, then it isn't valid. Right? That I have to let it go. And that's not true. Right? But sure enough, that will come up, and that's fine. Let that come up. Right? It comes up usually as a, as a defense against seeing the truth. So I want to take some time here this morning and I'm going to have you guys do some exercises. Those of you who have been here before are familiar with those, these. Those of you who are new, um, 
is not calisthenics. It is they're relatively benign uh, exercises that we do to try and dig into this topic a little bit and can you find a thread of it in your own experience? Rather than having me just continue to talk about it, I, I would much rather you get to know your own mind about this than really just hear more of my mind about it. So we're going to do exercises in groups of two. We're going to do uh, two repeating questions. All right, so I, in a moment, I will give you the questions. If you have something to write on, write them down. That's helpful. If you have a smartphone and you want to text yourself the question, you can do that. Um, I will also, when you get into your groups, I'll remind you what the question is. Um, at any point, if you forget, you can ask again. So it doesn't need to be stressful. So I'll give you the, the questions, and then I'll go over the um, outline of the, of the exercise, how to do it. So first question, what is right about imagining you are separate? What is right about imagining you are separate? What is right about imagining you are separate? Second question. What is it like to be whole? What is it like to be whole? So I'll say a little bit about these, give you a little context. So in the first question, the word imagining, right? So this is a, uh, a word that I've been using this morning to, you know, you can think of, of thinking, taking yourself to be, constructing reality in your mind is what I mean by imagining. Right? The, the what you take to be true. Right? This is a construction in your mind. And to be separate, again, is, is like we, have, we are imagining space as quantized. We're imagining space is broken up into all of these little units. That, that we do this with ourself, that we imagine ourself to be separate from all other selves. Completely an island unto myself. My experience is my experience. What happens to me happens to me. What happens to you happens to you. Right? And what's one, one of the, um, my favorite you know, kind of Christian sayings, right? Um, to, to see an other, usually an other who is, is suffering. And, we, and the saying is, um, there but for the grace of God go I. Right? I've heard that before. There, but for the grace of God, go I. And, and normally that's taken to be, you know, a good thing, you know, a, a, a positive affirmation you know, of the Christian value of grace. But in it, inherently in it, is this idea of separation, of like, thank God that happened to that person and not to me, right? That's the, the, you know, that's, that's this idea of separation. To not see that, that, that what has happened to that person, that person's struggle, that person's suffering, is my suffering. There is no difference. That is just me over there. But the reverse is true, right? Is that I'm them over here. You know, kind of balances out. We don't have to get too involved you know, and suffer their suffering. Because it's equally true in that that suffering isn't just theirs, it's equally mine. But my good fortune that I was just feeling in comparison over against that person's suffering, that good fortune that is mine is actually also theirs. So this idea of separateness, 
It's, it's fundamental to how we think and how we navigate the world, how we are in the world. We take ourselves to be separate. Sometimes we take ourselves to be separate, but then in our good moments, we see ourselves as a part of something, to be in relationship, right? to be part of a community. So I'm not completely separate. You know, like, there might be some defensiveness might come up. Like, I'm not completely separate. I'm part of a family. I'm part of a church. I'm part of a... I'm not completely separate. But the whole idea of relationship, like being in relationship with another or being in relationship with a community, the whole idea of relationship is based on separateness. You have to be separate in order to be in relationship. And so the idea of relationship just points to the pre previous belief of separateness. So this is what we want to look into with this question. Is what is right about imagining yourself to be separate? Just want to look into that. See what comes up. And then the second question is to look at the other side of that. Is what is it like to be whole? In this case, whole means whatever that brings to your mind, whatever arises in your experience that is the opposite of being separate. Whatever it is in your experience when the question is asked, that is some sense of non-separateness. But I don't want to put it in the negative form, right? non-separate, positive form, whole. What does it feel like to be whole? And to try and speak from that position. Right? Could you have a moment in ask, answering this question, could you have a moment of actually directly experiencing your wholeness? Right? Which this non-dual tradition would say that is the fundamental truth of you. It's like space. Right? Space is always whole. It doesn't ever, you can't have more of it, you can't have less of it, it's always whole. Yeah? And that you are that. That your true nature is always whole. You are never separate. You are always part of the whole. You are always the whole unto yourself. And so, if you allow yourself to just be open to the question, don't think about it too much, don't analyze it too much, but allow yourself to just be present to what's arising when the question is asked, you may have an experience of your wholeness and be able to answer directly from that place. And allow that to be a surprise to you, a surprise to your partner, right? that your true nature could show up in a moment and you could experience it directly and speak directly from there. So with the exercise, you get a partner, turn your chairs, face each other, sit a comfortable distance where you can hear, but you're also comfortable sitting there. I'll have a timer. I'll time the exercise. We'll do two minutes for each question. So you'll, you'll be asked for two minutes, and then you'll ask the question for two minutes. And then we'll go to the second question, and you'll be asked, and then you'll ask. Right? So first question gets done twice, then second question gets done twice. Yeah? And the goal here is to, to do your best to just spontaneously answer the question not from your mind that is trying to come up with the right answer, because there is no right answer. This is an opportunity to explore. It's an opportunity to let the question bring out of you something that you were previously unaware was there. So the more you can just simply be present and transparent and respond with what arises, the more the chance that you will land in the ground the question is pointing at. The more you try and be strategic and come up with a clever answer to the question, the more mind you will get.
not necessarily a bad thing, but not necessarily what the exercise and the questions are designed to do. They're not designed to bring more mind. They're designed as, as an invitation to this quality of your true nature, of your wholeness. Okay? So go ahead and grab a partner. I will repeat the question if needed. 